Good morning, one and all, and welcome to this rather exciting uh, joint session by Leopoldina and the Academy of Science of South Africa. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all on board uh, to engage with us on this exciting discussion on science communication during the times of uh, the COVID pandemic. We have an exquisite lineup of speakers from both South Africa and Germany, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from the experts on the, a number of issues that uh, we have been subjected to in the media, uh, particularly social media, and uh, it will be nice for them to set the record straight and for us to understand um, what the state of the pandemic is uh, around the globe and how we as advocates uh, of science can contribute in uh, ensuring the kind of trust uh, that the general public ought to have with respect to, to the science around this topic. So welcome one and all, and uh, I hope you enjoy the session. And, and once again, thanks to the panelists for giving up of their time unstintingly to allow us to have these uh, dialogues. So. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Himlia, for your uh, nice welcoming words. From the side of the Leopoldina, a warm welcome to all of you as well, wherever you are listening to us. For some of you, it might be very early in the morning, but we are very happy that you are all interested to, uh, to listen to the discussion. On behalf of the German National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina, I would like to warmly welcome you to today's virtual panel, Science Communication in Times of COVID Under the Spotlight, and it's a very bright spotlight we are hopefully shedding today. My name is Marina koch omrai I am the head of Leopoldina's International Relations Department. I'm very happy and proud to say that Leopoldina and the Academy of Sciences of South Africa, ASAF, have been cooperating continuously and in various fields of sciences and the humanities for almost a decade now. It is the third time that both academies are organizing a virtual panel on aspects and problems of the COVID-19 development. The Corona pandemic requires an ongoing, transparent, reliable and trustful communication of scientific expertise. And as Himla said, maybe most of the time we are talking to the already listening people, but we want to reach out. And we need therefore the international exchange of knowledge and experiences as well. And this is the purpose of today's event in which distinguished experts from Germany and South Africa will analyze science communication. And we hopefully will all come to conclusions and recommendations for the present and the future. And thank you very much for all of you that you are here with us today and give us your time and your insights. Today's event is part of the Leopoldina's international virtual panel series that we have come up with in the times of the pandemic. And we try to bring together international scientists, academies and other partners to address topics from different perspectives and angles. So now I'm looking forward to the discussion and I wish us all interesting and valuable insights. And I'm happy to hand over now to Rebecca Winkels, the moderator of this panel today. Rebecca, please. Thank you very much for the introduction and the very warm welcome. And of course, a warm welcome from my side to the audience as well. Um, I'm really happy to um, guide you through today's discussion. My name is Rebecca Winkels. I myself am a science communicator and the director of communications and strategy at Wissenschaft im Dialog, which is the biggest German science communication organization. And as for everyone involved in science communication, for me, the last two years have been particularly challenging, of course, in our field. And we have lear learned lots about our own discipline and about the things we do well and the things we maybe don't do well with. So I'm very glad to foster the debate around the opportunities and challenges the COVID pandemic has put us through as science communicator. And I'm hoping that we will find some solutions as was emphasized earlier. Um, and I'm very happy that we get to discuss that on an international level because I think it is an international uh, crisis and um, thus we need to find international solutions in science communication. 
Um, before I'm going to introduce the panel to you, I would like to address some technical matters. Um, the first one is a very easy one, and most of you will be familiar with it by now. Um, you can change the layout of your screen by uh, yourself to your preferred option. There's a, in the upper right corner, there's a section where you can change it to the version you want to have it. And then the other one is a very quick one, um, which is that we want to keep this an interactive panel. So please feel free to ask questions. You can put them in the chat and in the question and answer feature, and we will then um, bring them into this, the discussion. Um, before we start that, we would like to hear from our panel and each of our panelists will give a short introduction to their field of expertise and give you a short overview, which we will then have the debate about. Um, so this brings me to introducing our brilliant speakers for today. Um, I'm very happy to have Professor Dr. Kalika Milsana here, uh, a co-chairperson of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID in South Africa. But welcome to the panel, uh, Kalika. Um, we have Dr. Viola Prisman with us. She's a group like leader at Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization and the Bernstein Center for Computer and Neuroscience in Göttingen in Germany and has been one of the more prominent German scientists during the COVID pandemic, at least in the public's eye, I think. So very well, welcome to you, Viola. Um, we have Mia Milan with us, who's the founding editor-in-chief and executive director of Bixia, the Center for Health Journalism in South Africa. Um, and we have a Dr. David Schieferdecker with us, the principal researcher of the German government funded project Rapid COVID, receiving and accepting public information despite polarization key to overcoming COVID uh, from the Free University in Berlin. Um, a warm welcome to David. Hello, nice to have you here. And then last but not least, of course, we have Dr. Marina Jabera with us, a senior science communication researcher at the Center for Research on Adelaide evaluation science and technology at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. So very well, warm welcome to our panel. We're going to start things, kick things off um, with you, Kalika, and we're hearing your input statement, which uh, is mostly on science-based advice to policy policymakers. Um, and let's start with you. The floor is yours, I'd say. Um, thank you very much and uh, good morning to everybody. I really would like to thank uh, Leopoldina and the, you know, uh, Asaf, you know, for inviting me to this great uh, panel. And one is really looking forward to a great discussion. So if we really just look at um, how South Africa has been structured and how, you know, the, the COVID-19 response has been, firstly, you know, if one looks at the political, you know, the, the, the government response, so obviously most of everything that has been revolving around COVID-19 really sits in within the Ministry of Health, but we do know that it would not just be the Minister of Health alone, but so if you look at the Ministry of Health together with the Director General, then the body that the Minister of Health had set up was actually to formulate a ministerial advisory committee, the committee that I sit in and co-chair. And in fact, where we are right now, now, there are three different MECs, you know, that uh, 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 have been established. It's one on COVID-19, which is the member of the committee I'm in. Then there's the one for vaccines, and there's also a social behavioral MEC. So, and, and obviously from the Department of Health, then the minister would communicate with the various, you know, um, uh, 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 with other uh, MECs of health at all provinces, but there's also a link to the National Coronavirus Command Council, which then talks directly to, to the presidency. So there's a, a very a direct and, and obvious and very strong political direction and political guidance. And we have seen this happening throughout the pandemic in the country. But to then just come back to say another very important body within you know, the response has been the formation of the incidents management team, which falls within the Department of Health. And at the IMT, it is actually chaired by one of the DDGs. And this is where 
all the various uh, components that talk to the pandemic come in. It is where you'll find epidemiologists, where you'll find surveillance teams, which is the national, uh, you know, the NICD, you know, uh, National Institute for, for, for Communicable Diseases. It will be the laboratory and testing aspect. That's where NHLS would come in. Clinical, you know, clinical care. It would be also looking at resources and what is available. So the IMT looks at that. But from the MEGS perspective, what our responsibility has been, firstly, the MEG for COVID, if you look at the constituency, it really is a variety of expertise within the country. And this is where the scientists sit in, researchers sit in, we have epidemiologists, we have, you know, bioethicists, you would have, you know, people who are doing modeling. And so, so really you find that that's where the bulk of um, the scientific knowledge would actually come in. And how it has been set up is that the Department of Health the Minister of Health would then come to the to the MEC and say that these are the issues that we need assistance in. These are the you know issues we need um, advisories on, and we then would formulate within the MEC what we call technical working group. What has been very important has been the fact that you know it has been very clear from the beginning that the response to the pandemic has got to be scientifically driven because this was a new you know it's a new um, a disease altogether. There was a lot that was unknown. And so what we get from science was very important so to make sure that whatever decisions are made in response to the pandemic are based on scientific you know, uh, evidence. And so what we would do then as the MEC is depending on if, for instance, we want to see, you know, um, how, how what is the what are the numbers that we're seeing how is the epidemic going we would then look at the data that comes through the laboratories and there has been a very good um, interaction between the public and the private sector at collection of data laboratory wise and from that data we then would have evidence of what's happening in the clinics what's happening at uh, facility levels and there's also another database that has been formed which we call the dead curve which then brings in the clinical aspect. And we then look at science, where are we, what is actually coming out, what data is coming out, so that when we're crafting an advisory as to how to respond, where are the numbers going, what therefore should happen, that would be scientifically based. Now, how do we then communicate this? So we would craft an, an advisory, and this then gets uh, channeled through to the minister to the minister of health directly and we also present these advisories to the incidents management team i was talking about and this will be debated upon and then from the minister of health and imt it then would go through the channels you know within government and ultimately you know going to the president who then would make a, a decision so what we really have seen through all of this is we try as much as is possible and uh, to to make sure that whatever obviously advice we give is scientifically based. What has been maybe a challenge for us as scientists has been occasions where we have had to then communicate, you know, some of the, you know, the terms, communicate some of the entities around COVID-19 to the general public. And this has been done via webinars a lot of times where there will be a group of scientists who will be addressing specific, you know, specific uh, uh, um, areas around the, uh, the pandemic. And you find that it often becomes very, very difficult to explain some of these simple terms to the general public. And I think for me, that has been one of the major challenges that we have faced. But we continue to try as much as we can to make sure that we actually take the communities through, you know, by explaining these scientific terms as simply as we can. I think, let me rather just stop there and then, you know, we can take, you know, discussions, you know, when that time comes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalika. Um, that sounds like a very interesting system you've got in place there. I think it's a bit different in Germany, it works a bit different over here. Um, but for now, Viola, you have the perspective of being a scientist working in data modeling mostly, and that is not you, normally the field that gets the most media attention <laughs> and doesn't make you a regular talk show 
guest uh, per se. So maybe in your opening statement, I'm sure you're going to talk about communicative science work, make, making science, but how did the pandemic happen for you? How did you experience? So if you could hear from you, that would be wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, actually, I studied physics and I studied also physics because I love sitting in my quiet corner somewhere hidden and thinking about my equations for weeks and maybe months and talking to scientists. No, I did not do it because I want to have public attention or any of that. I still did it for the reason of really the need. I would like to briefly th therefore mention here three aspects that I now looking back to the COVID pandemics, especially the initial phase uh, realize. First of all, I've been working not on COVID, obviously. Uh, I've been working on spreading dynamics in neural networks. So how does activity spread in a neural network? This is basic research. It is potentially playing a role for future artificial intelligence. So inspired from living brains. The things that, or the tools that we had developed mathematically is how to investigate the spread of activity in such a neural network if you only see a tiny fraction of all neurons. And that might ring a bell for you. It would say, well, the spread of activity in a neural network, mathematically, that's very similar to the spread of a virus in a social network. And we also have the problem of under-reporting in both cases. We had the tools ready. So we started that early on when in China the disease started and no one really cared about it. So we had everything even in place and already working in March 2020 when it also hit Europe. Therefore, I would say, that's my first conclusion I would bring over here. I think basic research and also the ability that we had to invest all research time that we had on this new problem, that is one of the best crisis preparations that we can have. We don't know what's the next crisis, but there will be someone in basic research. If that person has the ability to just stop all the other activity, and I must say a big thank you to my team, and then invest a huge amount of effort and time into understanding that new field, that is really helpful. I had been, that's my second point, really impressed by the science communication in Germany and in the English speaking media that I could follow. That is extremely high quality. I think in the beginning, the scientists were farther in terms of their knowledge and the science communication was a bit behind, but they caught up very quickly. And in some point it was such that whenever I talked to science communication journalists, they knew more than I knew. So I could tell them about my specialized field they could tell me what's going on in the other fields. And that was a very rich exchange. I didn't want to be always in the media. So often I did this uh, German Hintergrundgespräche, this background discussions. We met on Tuesday noons with a couple of uh, journalists and just exchanged what is the current state. And they used that knowledge without citing me. I was very glad about that. But I also got inspiration there. What are the questions of tomorrow or maybe even in a couple of months? Because one has to start a couple of months earlier or let's say the impact of vaccination. That's something we started already in, in summer 2020. Um, so that is the good part. That was impressive. The difficult part is the following. Well, I got a huge number of requests, much more than I could ever handle. It's extremely time consuming. And then I wondered, aren't there other people who could take over for me? I had been drafting statements with colleagues. I have people in my own group and most of them, basically all of them who I asked said no. And that really should make us worry. What do you need for science communication? Obviously you need expertise. That's something all of them had. You need time. Well, none of us has time, but one could free a bit and try to share that. And the third thing that one needs is courage. Let's call it courage. One could also say that one has to be a bit suicidal to do that because while science communication, I think, and science journalism works extremely well, and it's a pleasure to read the text that these great journalists put together. They put your own work into so clear terms. It's beautiful. I often got inspiration from that. Because of being in the public debate and being in a heated debate, I was always afraid of being misquoted. And why is that a problem to me? I mean, I think it's a problem to anyone, but to a scientist, it's a particularly bad problem because we are building on our reputation on honor, on trust. So anything that we say in public, anything that we publish should be absolutely right. Otherwise my colleagues don't trust me anymore and think that I'm a not a serious scientist. So it damages my reputation potentially, at least that's how I felt it. And you never know whether there's not 
one journalist somewhere, typically not from science communication, who takes, for example, if he takes three scenario, a bad one, a mid one, a, a bad one, a probable one, and an optimistic one, they will take the bad one and take that into a headline, saying Prisemann says everything goes bad. This feels extremely bad. And that's one of the reasons why I did much less science communication that I could have done, because yeah, of literally not wanting that. I turned down a lot of these requests and I did not find anyone who would want to replace me in that. So I would hope that in future science, uh, no, sorry, journalism in general separates like we do it in science better between the current state and the facts and has a bit more balanced um, reporting there. And um, yeah, sorry. Okay, okay I put this, this very last statement here, which is, I mean, how does it feel? The, the term that I started to coin for that is really a thing, it feels like abuse. It feels like the abuse of your own name. If you are associated with statements or your name is associated with statements that you would never ever do that way. The way I so solved that is twofold. One is I often had, let's say, long periods where I had simply worked and completely rejected every of the attempts. And then when I had a new result out and it at least internally peer reviewed by colleagues. Then I would communicate it about it for two or three weeks, but then everything had been said about it and I could go back to science again. The other way I went about it, because it's highly interdisciplinary, I initiated and organized joint European statements because COVID is like Kaleka already mentioned, absolutely interdisciplinary, it's a society's problem. So we joined dozens, I joined dozens of researchers from across Europe trying to represent also all countries, making joint statements of how we as Europe, that's where I focused on, should handle jointly uh, the disease and the response to pandemics. And that helped me in two ways. First of all, it's peer review. It makes sure that we don't only have the epidemiological perspective. And I could speak not for myself, but I could speak basically for an entire group of scientists. And these statements even had been signed by over 1,000 scientists um, we basically collected these signatures and asked them. It was extremely well received. They have been published in the Lancet for anyone who wants to read them up. That's all I would like to say. So it is a hassle for many, and I'm not sure whether I can recommend that. But on the other hand, science journalism really makes a beautiful bridge and might also have to protect a bit the individuals and help them keep enough time for their research. Thank you. Thank you, Viola. Um, a lot of praise for science journalism, a lot of critical words, or at least highlighting the problems of that journalism also can have during the pandemic and also that communication effects have. Thank you for that. But Mia, you bring in the journalistic perspective here. So how is your view on the topic? Do, do those words just praised by Viola resonate with you? Is that similar to the experiences you made? Um, we, we can't hear you, you need to uh, turn on your mic. Sorry about that. So I think something that is very interesting for me about COVID is in my country, there's been two pandemics. HIV has been a very big pandemic and then there was COVID. And during HIV, scientists became activists because we had to fight so hard for access to treatment. And the difference is in COVID, they've become celebrities. Um, they are on TV every single day and on radio. And of course, it's become so much easier to put them on because the one thing that COVID really changed is the way that we do interviews, we use Zoom calls. So a scientist um, is not expected to go into a, um, a station. They can be used many times by many stations on a day. And if you also look at policymakers, if you're going to say Dr. Kuleka Melisana, people are, everyone else is going to know who she is because she's on TV so much and she explains things so many times where previously that would not have been the case for the scientists and the policymakers. But I think if we look at how do we as journalists communicate in COVID differently from policymakers, one of the big differences is the lexicon that we use, right? We use different 
different words. The policymakers use things like, and the scientists, like relative risk and capacity building and randomized controlled trials. And if we as journalists use those words, our audience would be very confused and they would be lost. But the reality with COVID is that they often are lost because so many journalists repeat these terms in stories because they were expected to become science communicators overnight. They were political and business journalists and all of a sudden had to report on very fast moving science. And that has sometimes resulted in mistakes and inaccuracy that has led to, to anxiety among the general public. But I do think a good thing that we're seeing is that because COVID or a pandemic speeds up processes so often, something that has happened is that we see scientists almost becoming journalists today. So I have seen so many Twitter threads that are done that is used as a form of communication by scientists. When they, when they publish a study, they will do a thread that breaks down um, that study or just explain general concepts. And that has translated to them being able to frame stories about science in the media, because what journalists would do who don't have a science background is to follow the angle in that um, Twitter thread that the scientists initiated and then build a story around it. They will either interview the scientists or they will do a story and quote those tweets. I think the other thing that we have seen in my country specifically is that Science journalists or health journalists are often used as almost like experts on TV, although they're not scientists, but to break down concepts. And that happened previously, but not to the extent that it's happening now. If I look at my own organization, Becca CISA, our journalists talk about the stories that they produce and general science concepts probably about nine to 10 times more often now on radio and television than we previously did. And that of course presents us with the same problem as scientists. It's incredibly time consuming and it's not like you just can go and speak about something you need to prepare for it. So our job descriptions as um, science journalists have changed a bit. We do fewer stories because we spend so much time to um, prepare for media interviews about our stories. But the interesting thing is that if we look at our metrics online, we have 22% more page views on our website than previously than last year, if we compare it to a year ago. And the interesting thing is last year it was already high because of COVID. So fewer stories or fewer science stories don't necessarily translate into fewer people reading or coming to your website. I think it's all about how meaningful you make it. And that brings me to are people still interested in COVID information? And that is an interesting question to answer because I think they're interested in stories that make this makes the science and the policies meaningful to them and help them to use it in their lives. They're no longer interested in stories that not just merely repeat the stats of the day, the number of vaccinations or the number of um, tests that were done. Although I do think on Twitter, that has become a way of reporting news, a non-traditional form of reporting news where you can tweet the daily numbers. But just to do a story about that, I don't think readers are that interested in it any longer. And how I know they are still interested in meaningful stories is if I look at our page views at our site that tries to do stories in such a way and that audience has been maintained. Contained. And I think we can compare it to HIV. There was a stage in my country, particularly in South Africa, where media or news editors felt there was fatigue when it came to HIV coverage. And our metrics, again, on our side during that time showed that HIV stories were the second top most read story on our website. And I think it's because it tried to mainstream the issue and to not necessarily um, build the story just about HIV, but more about where HIV fitted into society. So to do a story about teenage pregnancy and to talk about the risk of pregnancy as much as the risk of HIV and to combine those issues in a meaningful way. Um, I do think that um, the media has played a 
crucial role in communicating the science of COVID. But that has really been complicated by what I've mentioned previously, that so many political and business journalists were expected to report on science overnight, and they were not necessarily prepared for it. And that sometimes translated into inaccuracies or into a sensationalization of a policy. In my country, for instance, the health department has just released um, the idea of vaccine certificates. And there were so many inaccurate reports this week about is the site live, is the site not live, where you can download it. And it's caused so much anxiety around vaccine, mandated vaccines, and how would it work that, um, and, and again, there was a bit of lack of communication from our health department also about it. But had some journalists been more familiar with the processes behind this, I think there would have been lack less anxiety in the country. Something where there's been a definite lack in my country is um, reporting on the science of COVID in vernacular languages. That has definitely not happened to the extent that it should. And in many of our languages, um, words for science often don't exist for certain concepts. And this has been such a perfect opportunity to develop that lexicon. And I don't think that has happened to the extent that it should have happened. It also didn't happen to the extent that it should have happened from our health department. There's been constraints with resources in the department with communicating about COVID. And often the media has filled that role and that gap, but not always in a completely accurate way. So I think if we look at the broader communication in my country, we definitely need to also address the gap that there is, that we can't just communicate in English, but we need to communicate the same messages in other languages. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. And that also is a very good overlay, I think, almost to David, because uh, he's working on uh, he's a science communication expert and researcher so he looks at what is actually done and what works and also um, might be able to give us some insights into who we're actually reaching with the information that we have so David please uh, take it off from here. Thanks um, first of all I have to say I'm not an expert in, in science communication so my research does not focus on science communication in particular but I try to understand where people get their information about COVID from and how this relates to their stance, to their opinions towards the containment measures and containment policies. This research is uh, all, all done in Germany, but yeah, that's, um, that's yeah. Um, one thing is, um, I, my, my, my research is uh, usually, these are survey studies. So, so I, I, I base my input on, on, a, on a handful of survey studies that I did with my colleagues, uh, Torsten Fass and Philippe Jolie quantitative, qualitative work, it's, it's hundreds of hours of interviews, it's thousands of participants, so it's, it's, uh, it's more than okay social science data. When I thought about like, uh, when I thought about our data and reflected about the larger question of this, uh, of this panel, I, I, I came to yeah, three points emerged. First of all, I think the pandemic has been a stellar hour for engaged public um, science. Some of our colleagues, Viola among them, they are really doing a fascinating job educating the, the, the larger general public about findings and the workings of the disciplines. All of this at a high personal cost, particularly in a very polarized debate. The second point is scientists are very active, particularly on Twitter and trying to influence the public discourse and the policy agenda. Third point is, as a result of the open science movement, we have witnessed really citizens starting to engage with preprints, open access articles and primary data, all forms of communication that were initially produced as internal science communication. This is the first point. So create our for engaged public science. The second point is where people get their information from, it's, that's crucial. It's, it's a crucial point where they do get their information from. It's not that, like, that, we, that we see a, a perfect like, correlation between, okay, the more you use that kind of content and the more knowledge you have about this or that, but we see one point throughout all our studies and this is opponents of the containment measures, they are usually invested in some type of alternative media ecology. And, so it's people who strongly oppose the measures. They are usually exposed to non-journalist sources about COVID, 
And people who consume those non-generous sources on a regular basis, they usually become more critical of the measures. And it's very important that I'm not saying that everyone who's like critical of the measures went down the rabbit hole of the YouTube Academy or is following some obscure flat earther um, group on Telegram. In fact, I think this is one of the stereotypes in Germany that's detrimental to the discourse and uh, like one of the stereotypes that really delegitimizes people who are opposing certain measures. However, what we see is that opponents at least complement their more traditional media usage by non-journalist sources or in fact get, even if they get mainly journalist input, then it's pre-selected and curated by opinionated non-journalist actors. That's the, that's the second point. The third point is, we find that a certain segment of the population openly despises traditional media in Germany. It's a, it's a segment of 15 to 20 percent in our surveys, at least. Maybe that's more, but that's, that's, the, that's the estimate. Yet, both supporters and opponents, they share two points of criticism about the public communication on COVID. The first thing is the tone of the communication is perceived as being too alarming. That's a, a, continuous, a continuous finding. The second point is they highly criticize that public authorities, politicians, officials, and also scientists contradict themselves over the course of time. And I think these are two uh, critical points because we can learn how uh, external science communication can backfire. The first aspect is fear appeals can lead to denial and other forms of psychological reactance. And this may have detrimental uh, effects not only on prevention behavior, but also on beliefs and attitudes about the virus or the measures in general. The second point is, if reality turns out to be different to the prediction, at least in one or two crucial points, this can delegitimize not only the speaker in front of the audience, but also the institutions they stand for, particular if the prediction was done in an apodictic or um, yeah, apodictic way and uh, if the audience doesn't have the right understanding in how that statement came into the public, the very many steps that it took for that statement to, to came in the public. So I see three um, great challenges. Um, yeah, three great challenges. The first is I would say that media logic is going to mess up even the best external science communication, no matter what. So. Uh, I mean, communication doesn't reach the audience in one step. So even if you have the best trained journalist, he does have an editor or she does have an editor in chief, results will be skewed by some non-trained yellow press journalist, maybe then someone will share it and like a professional internet troll will share it. Your aunt is going to share it in the WhatsApp group and you just read the headline. And so, so this, is, this is the process. And um, I mean, even underlying is that journalists do follow a different logic for not 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 for like it's it's just a job. You need to simplify. You need to emphasize the extraordinary, the negative aspect. You need to blur over shades of gray, and you're going definitely going to spend less time with the limitations and the stats, like the specificities of this uh, of the stats. It's yeah, it's it's just inherent in in, in the in the system. Second challenge is I think it will be very challenging to strike a balance between trying to score a point in a political debate about an issue, but at the same time, not risking to lose trust in sciences and in institutions. So we see science is more trusted in our surveys than government, parliaments, even the courts. And I think it's a highly valuable good. And with the, with the increasingly complex world and the, the, the massive challenges that we face, maybe one could even say that the primary aim of science external science communication should be to remain trust in science as an institution and only it's secondary to score a point in a political base even if you think that you are like um that you can support your uh, support the point that you want to make with the evidence that you have and so probably this means we should not gloss over uncertainties should be very precise about the level of evidence that we can um, that, we, that we have behind our claims and also should try to speak collectively since one person can't represent the whole field. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the end. The third, uh, the third challenge that I see is, I think public needs to get a better understanding of the scientific process. Um, I mean, scientists want to be heard, citizens want to, want to engage with the science, but I think research designs 
and also the, uh, the the process how we produce knowledge it's nothing intuitive i mean just try to understand the importance of randomization it's a very it's it's nothing intuitive at least and um i think we we have seen that big misunderstanding and frustration of people since they expect science to resolve uncertainty uncertainties and to agree over a solution but for scientists obviously one study is no study and like a good study produces more questions than answers. So I think um, at large, science communication should um, really focus its energy on the meta communication that explains the work along the finding. Thanks. Thank you, David. I think for this, uh, the last part, part that is where scientists themselves as communicators are so important and they come in as a very important uh, figure in those debates because no one can Kind of better explain the processes behind than a scientist themselves. Marina, you um, work, do a lot of work on the role of scientists during the pandemic, so um, maybe you can take it from here and tell us a bit about how that evolved, how that maybe is different now from what it has been before, and maybe even make a connection to David's point about how that can help with the processes. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. So, Thinking about today, I realized that for most of my career, I had to explain to friends and family, you know, what public science communication is all about and why it matters. But not anymore. COVID-19 really changed that. The pandemic has really put science communication in the spotlight like never before, because people needed credible information and guidance and reassurance. And that led to a surge in the demand for scientists' expertise across many disciplines. And so for about 18 months already by now, science is hitting the headlines every day, even in media outlets that did not pay much attention to science before. So now more than ever, I think people need to, and people understand why we need scientists who are able and willing to explain complex topics and new advances in science. We know it's crucial to hear from experts that we can trust and who can speak to us in a way that we can understand. And I agree very much with David, not only about the science, but also the process of science. And as we've also heard today, another fundamental shift in the pandemic was that science moved visibly much closer to politics. That happened on a very public stage and really helped to make scientists and science in general more visible, along with all the challenges that come with that. So, I believe from my experience and also from some research I've done and colleagues have done in the last 18 months, there's a massively heightened awareness among scientists themselves about their role and their duty to engage with society, but also as Viola explained today, some of the risks and some of the challenges that come with that. This also includes the duty of scientists to stand up for science in the face of misinformation and how to deal with uncertainty, how to deal with preprints, all the things that were already mentioned now. But I think the bottom line, we can definitely say science is no longer in the ivory tower. Scientists and scientific advice have become part of the fabric of society. It features in our everyday conversations, and that is how it should be. And we've seen repeatedly how people have called on this uh, momentum that we have now to sustain it and to also bring that dialogue and urgency into other issues that we face, including the future challenges of climate change. Now, I want to say something specifically about this phenomenon of scientists who became household names and even celebrities during the pandemic, because I think it's very interesting and also useful to study it. Now, we all know that in some countries, there's been this, this phenomenon of almost celebrities. In Germany, a, a name that would come to mind would be Christian Drosten, and in South Africa, Salim Abdul Karim, but of course, there are many others as well. Oh, I do not think that scientists, or at least very rarely, would seek media prominence simply for the sake of fame. But I also see from evidence and from my own research that leading scientists know that high media visibility, whether it's through the mainstream traditional media or social media, can be a powerful tool that allows them to shape the public debate and become influential thought leaders. So it's, it's, it's important. It's, it's a power that scientists can use also for public good, not necessarily for their own reputations, could be one of the reasons, but also to influence the debate, to influence uh, public opinion, to bring funding, etc. During a time of crisis, also, scientists may perceive a strong moral obligation to give something back to society. They want to give people hope, and they may also be motivated by democratic goals that they want 
to really give people access to new knowledge because citizens have a right to have this access. Now we see then therefore that, that scientists who actually achieve a very, very high media profile proactively make time for the media. They nurture relationships with top journalists. They know that this is a, an important thing and it, it is time consuming, but obviously when they weigh up the benefits and the cost, it, it, it means that it, it, it has more benefit for them than risk. Although there's always an element of risk if you have a high media profile, because it goes hand in hand with public and peer scrutiny of their professional opinions, but also their private lives. And that is why we see that these science media stars are usually leading experts who occupy secure positions in the scientific world that can protect them against the criticism that will inevitably come. But we should also note, I think it's really important that scientists who achieve superstar status are unusual. This phenomenon only occurs when unusual circumstances collide with exceptional individuals. And there are only a handful of them in each discipline around the world. Society actually needs a much broader cohort of scientists who are willing and able to engage. And that is why I think it's useful to study why some scientists, not only the very visible ones, but across many disciplines, become trusted and popular media sources. And because if you can understand why they are so popular, you can learn something about effective science communication that other scientists can use. And to this end, I analyzed some of the media appearances of Professor Salim Abdul Karim early during the pandemic. And my research clearly shows that he delivers clear messages using metaphors and stories and language that people can understand. He expresses empathy about suffering and loss helping him to connect with people on an emotional level. He importantly talks about the process of science. He explains the inherent uncertainties. He also talks about peer review and why he waits for evidence before he makes up his mind. He explains that it's good for scientists to disagree. He actually said in one interview, if scientists don't disagree with one another, we should be worried because that's how they test evidence and that's how they, they challenge each other. And that's really important. And he explains why it is important. And you can also see um, there was a lot of media interest in the man behind the scientist, but he remains human, he remains humble, he always talks, you know, gives a lot of credit to others. And I, I think, you know, in a nutshell, he was able to combine two crucial aspects of public trust, and that's credibility with an emotional warmth, and that seemed to make a crucial difference. I think, you know, there's a lot that we can learn from that. We know, of course, that these criteria for successful public engagement have been proved through earlier research. It's actually nothing new. This is research that we've already had for a number of years now in this field called evidence-based science communication. So let me just give you one more example. I recently came across a cartoon where a group of COVID-19 scientists are talking to one another in the one corner of the room, and they say to each other, if we only give the people the facts, everything will be okay. People will follow our advice, surely. And in the other side of the room, there are some climate change scientists listening to them and, and they're actually laughing at them. And the reason for this is that climate change scientists after more than a decade have learned an important science communication lesson the hard way. And this new insight is now endorsed by leading um, academies of science and, and scholars in our field around the world. And this is simply when people don't follow scientific advice, it's not necessarily because they don't have the information. It is crucial to give them the facts and to give them information, but that alone is not the whole picture. Often they have ample information, but some people, not everybody, some people choose to ignore, deny or oppose the science. And this simply means it's a very hard lesson for scientists, but more knowledge does not equal more support. And this is simply because people's opinions about science and the way where they respond to scientific advice depends on a complex mix of their own worldviews, prior experiences, concerns, and expectations. So crucially, if their opinions and views are not formed by facts, it won't be changed by adding more facts. So please don't think that I'm saying facts are not important. If they are, but we need something else. We need an emotional connection. If we really want to engage the public with science, we have to strive for respectful dialogue. We have to speak to their hearts as well as their minds. We have to listen to their concerns sincerely, and we have to find common ground. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Um, David, did you want to add something? I thought you raised your hand earlier, or is it already passed? 
Okay. Um, then maybe, maybe as you just posed some of the um, things that a scientist should do, I'm going to turn over to Viola. And um, does that resonate with you at all? What Marina says is that something? The emotional connection. How is your experience with that? I know it's been quite a tough year for communicating scientists. So do you do you feel you're able to make an emotional connection? I think this description of ideal science communication very well also applies to Christian Drosten. And I think what Christian Drosten in Germany had was this big advantage of having his, in quote, own media outlet with his podcast. He had an extremely good science journalist who basically put the right questions to prepare the frame for that entire interview. Maybe it would have been helpful to have the same for the theory for the epidemics as well as our epidemiology, not only for the for virology, which obviously is very central, but initially is also about spreading why does uh, the disease spread. I do know that in the background, I very often talked also to Christian Drost and Sandra Zizek, who then both did this postcard to, podcast together. We shouldn't forget Sandra. And, um, and uh, try to explain these details. And then they translated to the public. But nonetheless, epidemiology stayed the smaller part there. Does it resonate? It's difficult to speak to the minds and the hearts because we as scientists are taught to take out the hearts from our science. And it's very difficult to put them in and still stay you know, serious. And then you all, I think all said also, we must be very careful not to to risk the high level of trust that we have in science and when and then it's difficult to find a balance I, I wouldn't even have a precise idea of how one would strike this balance i mean intuitively one can do it by saying well i also have similar problems i understand the concerns here and there that's one aspect in terms of the way of communication but I'm not exactly sure how far also you mean this aspect. I find it very beautiful to say we have to speak to the minds and the hearts, but I would also like to know what that means really in practice and where are the borders so that one doesn't become an activist. Any ideas on that maybe, Maureen? Now, what does it mean? Where yes, does the what I would say, uh, we actually have, I mean, I could, I could try and give a very simplistic formula, but it isn't as simple as that. But the, we have evidence that public trust is actually made up of credibility and warmth. And scientists are sometimes perceived as credible, but cold. And that is a problem. So if you can have both, it's the credibility is important, the expertise. But if you can also add a human element, if you can tell a personal story, it can be as simple as saying, I'm also concerned about what is happening in the world, or you know, I'm I'm also worried because a good friend of mine is currently ill, or something like that. Just something to show that you're also a human being, you also care. It doesn't have to be, you know, a emotion in the sense of you know bursting into tears it's, it's just showing that you that you have that you also care you, you you feel sorry for people who are affected you want you 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 know it's talking about you know what scientists are striving for how they're trying to make a difference how important it is to hear them how important it is to you personally to to make a difference during the time of the pandemic that can be enough just to make the audience see that you care and then you they will listen to you they will trust you much more than if you just bombard them with cold facts with no human connection yeah one of the initial statements that i once made which also is maybe one of such examples is that but i was off especially beginning of winter 2020 21 um we had to make predictions of yes there will be another wave and calling this you know i'm again the person who has to pour water into your wine i really don't want to do that but this is what the numbers are this is roughly the ranges that we expect this is kind of the capacity of people who are not yet being immunized that kind of resonated very well that's one of the examples just also saying that i don't do that for being the bad person but it's also difficult for myself mm -hmm. yeah thank you uh, mia you wanted to add something to this Yes, I, I wanted to add to that from a media perspective. So we find in stories that, um, you know, you always argue that journalists must get the science correct, but you can have as accurate science as you want in a story. If you do not know how to break down that information in a way that people understand it, and more importantly, how to stagger it in a story in a way that you create an appetite for people to want to know that information, you can be as accurate as you want. No one will read that story. And I think it's similar to scientists. It's all great and well if you want to be warm and human. But if you do not know in an interview how to break down the information and 
how to give bits of information that entice people to want to know a little bit more. People are un unlikely to engage with you. And in news stories or in the media, to produce stories that breaks down science accurate, both accurately and in a way that people find it very easy to understand and to stagger it in a way that it becomes compelling. It takes a lot longer to produce a story like that than to just like repeat mere statistics or to just do a new story of the day. And I have learned during COVID, one of the most important lessons I've learned as a journalist and an editor is that less is more. It's better to do a meaningful story rather than to do many stories that people are in the end unlikely to read beyond the third paragraph. And I've also learned that relationships with scientists have become invaluable because during a pandemic where science moves so fast, we as journalists are so reliant on scientists to check the accuracy of the stories because we don't always know if it's accurate. The other thing I've learned is that if you do fewer stories and you make sure that they're meaningful and accurate, people start to trust you and that trust relates, translates when it comes to policymakers into access to them to get information. If they trust you, they're going to give you more time and they're often going to give you the information before other journalists that they don't trust as much would get it. And that translates into you as a science and policy communicator to be able to get better and more information out there. Thank you, Mia. Um, Kalika, you wanted to add something to that, but also thinking about the policy level we are speaking about now. So um, do you think that emotionalization is, or if we, that might be going a stretch too far, but that showing the human side is also true to, from, to when you communicate with policymakers, Kalika, maybe you can add that into your statement that you all wanted to give. Okay, no, th thank you very much for, for that. And uh, really, I, I think for me, the point I just wanted to add was, you know, I heard how Marina, you know, related how this whole scientist becoming, you know, a, you know, people who are presenting the science, you know, at community level, and how some of them have really mastered this well. And I think one speaking from a scientist perspective, firstly, you know, we not all of us have got the ability, not all of us have been trained in actually being able to talk to the public, you know, spontaneously. And really for me personally, for instance, an example is that when, when a journalist asks to speak to me, I find that it is more, it, I'm more comfortable if it's going to be a recorded session where, you know, I'm able to go through the details of the questions and I can ensure that, you know, whatever evidence is given is correct evidence as opposed to a live interview. And there's always this tension if it's a live interview, is he or she gonna try and trick me into saying something and sensationalize everything that I'm gonna be saying. And I think uh, we do need to find a way of how do we then ensure that even the journalists themselves, as they ask these questions, the idea is to get the correct information and it's got to be as human as, as, as we possibly can do that. And because sometimes you find that some of the questions and some of the nature of the interview, it is more to sensationalize everything, which at the end of the day, it really just misses the mark because then obviously the public is going to latch onto the sensation more than you know the, the fundamental message that is being driven across and so i think we do need to find a striking balance between that and and, and for me the, the, the other issue i have really noticed as well rebecca is that you know sometimes yes and i fully agree with slim it's always good that's what good science is when there's actually interaction, there's uh, disagreements, because that's how we improve, you know, uh, the level of science and the robustness of science. But I think also it, it becomes important as scientists as well to get a, 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 an understanding of when does our disagreement 
becomes detrimental to the message that we are putting across. Because I would imagine that each and every scientist wants to ensure that whatever data you have accumulated and whatever data you are presenting at the end of the day, it must you must make sure that it is to actually you know uh, 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 send the correct message so that the response to the pandemic is a response that we are all looking forward to. Because sometimes I have felt you know, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a level at which some scientists will really just want to disagree just for the sake of disagreeing. And then journalists, you know, catch that up and they just use that and we lose, you know, the, the, the fundamental message at the end of the day. And so I'm really not sure how do we strike that balance. And I suppose we all are learning in the process as to, you know, who then gets to be the expert in scientific communication when you are not really trained to do that. Thanks. Thank you, Kalika. Um, David, maybe um, addressing that uh, thing about speaking with one voice almost or coming together as scientists and not putting the emphasis on the debates, on the scientific details. What do you think about that? Isn't that, it doesn't that go against the things you were saying about trust? A bit? I think that's, that's like the, that discussion is really, uh, Underlining the point that I tried to make about media logics, because I mean, I'm like with the with the open science, like with the open science movement, I'm incentivized, and I also believe that it's very important to document not just the data that you use, but also to document the doubts that you have about your own data. So when I, I I'm not sure how it is in the in the in the like in the in the in the science, but in the social sciences, the like the 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 perfect. I do a project. I write it up. I do have thoughts about my data that I think are worth um, communicating. Thirty thousand words. I break it down to eight thousand words. Means I leave things out. I prioritize. There's a lot in the back that I don't put in there. I mean, I can condense things, but just to a certain point, and I have to kill my darlings. I put together robustness tests, sensitivity anal analysis, and an online supplementary material. It may be another 40 tables, 50 tables, all this stuff that just adds to the small sentences in the main paper. Now I'm asked to uh, boil it down to 200 words, just for the abstract. That's already a pain. I'm already like losing shades of gray. Now I'm asked to boil it down to a headline, to, to one line, to give it a personal aspect as well. And I mean, that's, that's obviously, it's absolutely, it's fine. That's, that's probably the way how the audience wants to have it. I mean, that's the way how I want to have insights from virology. That's the way I consume. Uh, news that that's the way how I consume um, media, but but it's a different logic to the logic that I'm working under. It's it's a completely different logic, and that's I, I think I'm not sure how we can like how we can harmonize these two different logics. Any ideas on harmonizing those those logics, Mia, who as an experienced science journalist? Um, you need to unmute yourself, please. I don't really have a solution, but I think it is useful to point out when scientists use the media to fight their politics with each other, what the consequences for the media is. And in my country, that has happened to a significant extent during COVID. Um, there was a lot of politics in our ministerial advisory committee initially about lockdown politics, you know, that argument of livelihood um, versus health, sort of like, what is the, how useful is lockdown? And for a pandemic, I think it's very healthy for scientists to um, argue about the science behind it. But when that debate becomes one about personalities, it's not useful for a pandemic to be advanced. And what happens in the media then is when you deal with non-specialist journalists who are not necessarily that familiar with the science studies behind, say in this case, lockdown, it plays out as politics far more than the politics of science. And in my country, it became a 
debate of who's trusted in the ministerial advisory committee or favored and who isn't, as opposed to what is the merits of lockdown and what is, you know, the pros and cons of it. And in my opinion, that was not useful for a pandemic, for public, for science communication. It wasn't useful to give people the general public information to use to know, should I stick to lockdown rules or shouldn't I? It became a whole thing around personalities. And I don't know how scientists, how you get them to stand together because I think it's, it's healthy to differ, but it's not healthy when you change the debate from science to a personality one. And um, that might be something that scientists want to think about in the middle of a pandemic, what could be the most useful way of communicating. Oh, thank you very much, Mia. Um, Viola, you had something to add on the speaking with one voice, and I'm sure you have something to add on the, um, is that even possible and what can we do about it as well? I think the speaking with one voice has been put here a bit in contrast to the question of should we have a public debate and i do think we want to speak when, with one voice from science about the knowledge the current state of knowledge which changes almost from day to day about the uncertainty and then also about the potential conclusions but clearly separate the three and the problem that i saw in the past COVID 19 pandemic times is that journalists and also public somehow knew there is obviously debate in science. We know that there's the stuff we know and there's the stuff where we have uncertainty and there can be debates about whether parameter is a bit larger or sort of, uh, uh, lower. Let's take, for example, how well does the vaccine protect against transmitting the disease? Some just said they don't anymore. The vaccinated people, the others said, well, but they still do, so we should be careful. But this is not a, quantit this is not a quantitative debate. The question should have been, what is our estimate of how likely it is that a person is still transmitting? And it's well, there was no room in asking for the question of how much, but it was just polarizing into yes and no. And that is one of the examples where I think the public debate was then not on the level where the science um, discourse was, but it does it, it did a pseudo debate on a lower level where in principle there had been agreement. I mean, in the vaccination case, it might be an extreme case. But th there was a pseudo debate then in public media because they thought they have to put a, a debate, but they didn't have, unfortunately, the knowledge to do that debate on the level where the scientists are debating. And there I would really, really wish for, for a better review and more time for, let's say, research. I would almost wish for, for science journalism at times to look at the journal articles in other of the sections of a newspaper or elsewhere just at least to feed back to people when they're doing a debate. I mean, you start a debate all typically with some facts and those facts that I had been reading were often completely outdated, for example, on the deadliness of COVID that was known since mid 2020. It was very well known what's the age dependent probability to die. Um, and if you then use completely outdated or maybe wishful thinking type of facts, then sure you can make any debate and it's interesting. And I would have loved much more interaction there within, let's say, the one media group between the section of science journalism who were really typically, no matter which newspaper, no matter which media outlet, I think they knew what's going on and at least feedback back to the other journals. That I think could have helped a lot to the public debate because I think the public debate and the scientific aspect were often, or partly at least, a pseudo debate. Thank you. Um, Marina, to that point, you wanted to add some of that, and then we're going to move on to some questions from the audience. Yes, uh, thank you, Rebecca. I'll keep it very brief. I just wanted to comment very briefly. It's true what Paola also said, that the way scientists are trained is very different from to communicate within science, you know, in the peer reviewed journals and conferences, very different from what you need to be successful at public communication. And in a way, they almost have to unlearn what they have learned, you know, if they want to be successful with the public. Um, I think when journalists and scientists work together, you know, we really have the two cultures meeting. And it's true that we can expect of journalists to understand more about the process of science. But similarly, at the same time, I think we should also understand that when scientists want to engage with the media, they also need to understand how the media works, what, how the public opinion forming works, and what, what are news values, you know, what are, you know, the process whereby news gets generated. Because if you 
go to a scientific journal or conference, you can play by the rules of science. But if you go to a, a media um, interview, you have to play by the rules of the media. It's just really in your own interest and in the interest of, of public communication to do that. So it's it's all about understanding how the media works, understanding how public opinion works, and and really investing the time to prepare according to those rules. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so there's a question from the audience that um, probably resonates with the German members of the panel very, very well, because it's um, whether in the beginning of the pandemic, we had the, they have the impression that there was basic science like biology was overrepresented in the um, evidence-based policymaking and also in the communication, whereas then the social science was a bit underrepresented and maybe didn't get a say to it till a very late point. Do you think that 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 is true? What does that do for the public debate? Does that change the way people consume news? Maybe Marina, yeah. So just very briefly, this is actually spot on a topic that we are doing research on at the moment in South Africa, and we have hard data showing that that is indeed true, especially in the early uh, six, first six months of the pandemic, health scientists uh, dominated by far. Um, it's only much later when, when your social scientists and behavior scientists and economists started getting a voice. And interestingly, along, along with that, also we, we have solid evidence that male voices dominated over female experts. I'll leave it to somebody else to, to reflect on what it means. <laughs> Anyone, what does that mean for the debate? Is it, is it harmful to the way the public maybe takes up information or the public forms its opinion? Do you think that has an effect on it? Maybe if I can just chip in. Actually, I'm wondering, you know, on the other hand, you know, whether there wasn't a good element to that at the beginning, but maybe the question might be, it could have been moderated on because we were dealing with a new entity or and therefore, there was a need for whatever messaging that's getting across to the communities to actually be scientifically based messaging. What is this pandemic? What is COVID-19? What is it all about? And so it was necessary to actually ensure that this, you know, the scientific information is what was leading. But I think where we probably add was maybe we didn't know when to then bring in all the other aspects. And, and, and as a result, and I mean, I fully agree with, we're seeing the same thing in South Africa, as Marina has said, but that it's only late that we're now bringing social behavioral scientists, we're bringing in, you know, other aspects, and even for that matter, advocacy around, you know, the whole issue. Now we're stuck with vaccine hesitancy, and um, the, you're finding that then there's really nowhere to go as to who then can come in and advocate, you know, for, 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 for increasing vaccine acceptance. And we have sort of left, I feel, civil society, you know, um, uh, uh, coming and becoming very prominent in driving the response to the to the pandemic. And I think for us as a, as a country, South Africa, when we had actually seen how community engagement actually uh, managed to, 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 to drive you know, our response to HIV as an uh, epidemic that we have not seen with COVID-19. And so we probably do need to draw those lessons and say, Having a small issue with the audio here. Um, maybe Mia, um, maybe you can chip in while uh, we're trying to get Kalika back to the uh, conversation. So, so my comment is from a journalism perspective. So there's often that argument that you know is does the media decide um, for the society what to think about? So do we come up with our own issues to report on, or do we just reflect society? Now I would argue in a pandemic, during a pandemic where very few, where you have to report on science essentially, and very few journalists are equipped with that scientific background. Um, the media generally doesn't decide for society what to think about, they reflect what they're given essentially, because we're not equipped with their skills, you know, because of the nature of the stuff that we need to report on. And in that aspect, I would say that what scientists do and what they focus on, whether that is pure scientific information or social science as well, 
um, will be directly reflected in the media. And that's what I'm trying to say is what scientists decide to focus on is even more important during a pandemic because it translates so directly to what you're going to see reflected in the media because that context of journalists reporting within a context of not really being equipped to think of the science issues, you know, other science issues that, 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 that scientists don't directly raise. So it's something maybe for the public science community to think about that what they raise is going to be almost exactly translated into in the media, sometimes in an inaccurate way, maybe, but, but those issues um, are the ones that will frame the debate essentially. So it's even more important to think about that. Yeah, thank you very much. We have Kalika back. Do you want to finish your point or? Oh, I can still not hear you. Okay, there seems to be a connection problem there, I think. Um... You, you know what, Rebecca, I'm so sorry. For some reason, my network is very unstable. Um, so let me just try it. Yeah. We're going to give you a few minutes to fix it, maybe, and see where we go with that. Um, I'm going to um, move on to another, yeah. to another very important issue or a very important thing. Um, there's been some questions from the audience surrounding misinformation and conspiracy myth, as we have that as a very dominant problem, or at least as a problem that is very prominently featured in the media, maybe. What are your thoughts on that? Is there any reason why conspiracy myths around this corona topic are so present and why are they debated so hugely in the public eye and how can we deal with them basically? Me as your, your hand is still raised from before. Or? Um, have you, um, maybe Viola, have you experienced any backlash from uh, conspiracy myths? Have you been confronted by them? How do you deal with them personally? Maybe? Yeah, how do I deal with that? I find it very difficult. Recently, I read that apparently these fact checking efforts seem to be quite helpful because I, I'm being approached by people who have different opinions by email on Twitter. I have uh, quite a bit of activity on Twitter. And also in my own yeah, personal contacts, there are people who are kind of close to these ideas. So we are discussing that broadly. Um, I find it very difficult because I don't know how and what is really the optimal way to go about it. One point that I stumbled over is what's called the Brandolini law. It's very easy to put a misconception out there into the public and it takes about 10 times longer to try to clarify it. Uh, for example, there was in Germany very recently this debate of oh, only uh, three percent, I guess, of the hospital beds of intensive care units had been covered by COVID. So how could it be full? I mean, why why was there all this hassle about the overfilled ICU capacity if there's only and that was official data three percent of the beds in ICU being used by COVID patients? And then it's like. You have to dive really into where does this number come from. In this case, it comes from um, it comes from yeah official reports, but it's averaged over the year of 2020. The first wave in Germany was really small, so there was hardly anything. The summer was basically empty, and then in November the wave took took speed. Mid November it reached the hospitals, and then they were really full in January February of 2021. So that was a different time. Second point is. Well, I mean, 80% of hospital beds are in intensive care are used for many, many other important treatments, like uh, yeah, heart attacks, you know, anything that goes to intensive care. You can't just free 100% of it and tell people, please wait with your heart attack until COVID is over. And it's one of the big problems. So 3% average over an entire year where there was hardly any infections for two out of 10 months is a reasonable number. And most of all, Germany is a fairly large country. There were these peaks in specific locations, for example, Saxony, and these peaks locally pose a problem because you can't just easily transport a intensive care unit patient to a different place. We saw the helicopters driving in and out from getting where I live almost on an hourly basis when this was this extremely high COVID uh, times in Saxony, which was close by. So they tried to distribute, but it's not that easy to just distribute intensive care unit patients. So the 3% are probably correct, but they have been misused as an argument of 
there had not been any overwhelmed hospitals. Why had there been such a panic about it? But clarifying that really takes a lot of time of diving into that. And then even if one clarifies it, one doesn't even know whether one can reach the people with that. Yeah, and um, maybe maybe adding to that um, is there has been an ongoing debate about if we should control social media somehow, what we can do to foster better debates on social media. Um, are there any thoughts of that? Do you think maybe from a science communication communi um, expert point of view, Marina, do you think we need to um, challenge those systems and platforms more? Do we need to um, do something about them? Well, I think we've all seen some of the efforts already made by platforms like Facebook, you know, with fact checking, with linking back to fact checking services. I'm also quite interested in this phenomenon of fact checking. And I think more research is needed about how the public responds to that, whether they find it useful, whether they're able to make better informed judgments about what to share and what to believe and, and so on, and what to trust. I mean, really understanding evidence. So I think this it will take some time. Um, of course, I'm, I'm a proponent of media freedom in general, but I think we also freedom you know, comes with responsibilities and we have to prevent harm. Um, the topic of conspiracy theories is, is so, you know, obviously such a big issue, a difficult one. The only thing I would like to add at this stage, and I think it's a topic that we need to really explore a lot more with, with psychologists and you know, getting us to understand why people buy into these conspiracy theories. But I do think that scientists have a responsibility to speak up. If they keep quiet, the only voices or, or these voices will you know, spread up without any regulation and without any um, sort of counteracting. So I, I do think scientists collectively and individually can really make a difference by just talking about it, not pretending that they have all the answers, but responding and becoming part of the debate. Because if they don't, you know, then, then, then the public never will hear um, a more reasonable, more logical view. Um, so, I think, especially when it comes to dangerous conspiracy theories, there's a role for academies and learned societies to, to bring together and say, we, we are here with a, with a view of 5,000 scientists or 500 scientists, you know, to, to also give weight to the, to the more um, logical um, evidence and viewpoint. If we can't afford to ignore it, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Um, Mia, is that an old hand or a new hand that you're raising? So. Is old okay. Um, I still can't hear you. Yeah, <laughs> that was a double. COVID has, COVID has meant that um, I think most journalists have started to use social media significantly more than previously, and of course that is the um, platform that um, people who spread misinformation use so effectively, and that means we can't ignore using it because that's the platform that they use. We should use it to give the correct information. So something that I have found very useful is to um, we we get a lot of anti-vaxxers, you know, attacking us on, on Twitter, for instance, is to ignore the person, like never respond, but respond to the audience that they're trying to reach. And the audience they're trying to reach is vaccine hesitant people in the case of anti-vaxxers. So those people who are sitting on the fence. So an example would be if they attack us about the efficacy of a vaccine, we wouldn't respond. We would rather just do a completely different threat all of a sudden about how does the effect, how do scientists determine the efficacy of a vaccine? And that then addresses the audience because all the research shows us to try and counter anti-vaxxer is, is pretty meaningless. You're not going to convince people, but you can convince the audience that they try to reach. And they're such a small part, the anti-vaxxers of the vaccine hesitant people, that um, it's, it's it's, it's really useful to try and address the audience. And the way in which we do it is a journalism technique that is known as the sandwich method, which basically means that you bury the myth or the wrong thing in the middle of two correct facts. And that way, um, media studies have shown that you then run a much lower list risk of amplifying the wrong thing, the incorrect thing. Um, and that works pretty well for us. It, it's, it, it, then you essentially spread the right, right information in a non-sensationalist way without the um, person who raised the wrong thing initially feeling acknowledged and in other words, um, spurring that person on to say more wrong things or to, to, to end up in a meaningless, meaningless conversation with you because it will be a never ending conversation.
Thank you very much. I think that's a method we've all tried to use at least, uh, while it remains um, a struggle and a challenge to compose those. Uh, Kalik, um, one last uh, statement on that, maybe before we go into a closing round already, because we're a bit ahead of schedule. Thanks. I was just going to thank Mia actually for that, because I mean, those are some of the issues that one often struggles with, you know, when, when somebody just, this misinformation comes out, you obviously you don't want to directly attack it because it just then you know uses so much energy and you don't achieve anything at the end of the day. I think for me the other question I wanted to raise was how do we change um, this, the you know the communities to know which are the correct sources of information, you know reliable information. How do they access that? Because I mean, as we say, unfortunately, social media—that's where disinformation has just been rampant. But then, how do you direct the communities to identify and know which are the reliable sources of information? And I really am asking because I don't know the answer to this. The answer probably is manifold and could go on. Um... <laughs> <laughs> for for an hour about that. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to wrap it up by saying some by giving each of you the chance to say something about maybe one learning you had from the pandemic or the biggest change you see that needs to be happening to have better science communication from your personal field or view or perspective that you've brought in so brilliantly into this discussion. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Marina this time because we've closed with her last time, so we're going backwards now. Thank you, Rebecca. I think the panel today, you know, bringing together policymakers, researchers who look at, you know, in where people get information, a scientist with experience of uh, speaking to the public, uh, Mia, who's, you know, an experienced journalist, I think it, it really reflects the the diversity of, of skills and expertise we need to tackle this very complex problem of effective science communication about COVID, but also you know, other challenges that we face. And I think the one thing that I would like to see change, I mean, there are more, but I would just maybe stick to one thing is that, that young scientists from an early age in their training, even undergraduate, but definitely those who go on to postgraduate must be given an, an opportunity to reflect on science and society, how they fit into the bigger picture, what it means to engage, why it in, is enriching to engage. Um, I just think we, you know, I studied science for many years, okay, long ago, and we just purely focused on the science. We never took a step back and looked at our role in society. And I only, be, you know, went into this field much later. So uh, young scientists, in my experience, are hungry for this. They're ready for this. They, we've seen a lot, we've learned a lot during the pandemic, and I think we can take it further into a new generation of scientists that are socially respondent and socially aware and, and skilled at communication. David, what's your takeaway for the future? I mean, my takeaway is really that, that, that probably like that our, our expectations or our aims about external science communication should be relatively modest, that we like really, yeah, rather have modest aims than, 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 than losing out in a major way. So really repeating the basics. I mean, basic findings in our uh, surveys, we find that 25, 20 to 25%, that's, that's the, um, that's the percentage of people who get really the most um, elementary things wrong in terms of, for example, mask wearing. Is a medical mask protecting yourself or other people? It's 25% of the people who don't answer it correctly or who have at least, let's say, different beliefs about it. One of the two things. The, the other thing, uh, I mean, Viola mentioned it, like really um, repeating relentlessly the basics of how the scientific process works. Really repeating the difference between are we interested in effect or is it actually a discussion about the effect size? I mean, that's, that's, that's something, it's, it's so basic, but it's difficult at the same time. I, I, I don't know why, but it's, it's like this, probably we, we, we are pro programmed in the wrong way in that sense. Uh, yes. The third thing is, I, I don't think that everyone should be and needs to be a science communicator. Not every scientist should be a science communicator. And I, I would like to stress really the importance of associations of the collective if there's like if there's a couple of people who are uh, overviewing a field then they may do a qualified statement 
again about those things that are relatively certain at that point in time. Now the now the now the big like the the why isn't that like uh, that easy? The first thing is obviously these things are nothing new, and I, I don't know. Mia can can say something about it. it's probably not that easy to uh, like get a hundred story about which type of mask is the correct mask uh, get it out there the second thing is it's a hyper dynamic um it's a hyper dynamic uh, situation things just change and new develop a new knowledge pops up and it needs to be out as well so that we can't wait for an association to settle settle down with it and publish it in nature and the third thing is obviously there's also incentives for for uh, journalists to get out uh, for scientists to get out as soon as possible to present the cutting edgeness of their work to get the recognition for being first that's also part part of it why people why people in my my generation they probably spend as much time on twitter than yeah a scientist which is which is interesting thanks thank you very much david um, mia what, what is your take home message from this discussion what has been really interesting for me from the discussion is that there's more overlap between journalist jobs now and that of policymakers and scientists because policymakers and scientists have started to communicate far more directly um, in the same way as journalists with audiences because of all these radio and television interviews. So it will be very interesting for me to see how um, the similarities lead to a stronger relationship between the media and you know, science communicators or public, uh, policy communicators. The other lesson that I have learned to uh, uh, during COVID, um, and it relates to what David was saying, is you know, if you want to do the hundredth story about how to use a mask or which mask is better, is to um, look at different formats of storytelling. So what happened to us during this time is we normally have a decision-making audience at Begisisa, and then because of COVID, we got a broader audience. And we have to adjust the way in which we tell stories to reach those broader people. And one of the very useful things have been to start to do short videos. So to do the same print story into a much shorter video format and um, that mask works brilliantly if you do an animated video. Um, all of a sudden people are interested when they weren't interested in it at all when you did a print story. Thank you very much, Mia. Um, Viola, what are your takeaway messages? For, what do you gain from this discussion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like this aspect of the animated story and reaching them via different media channels. That's something that we as scientists really can't stand. We are really good at doing science and I think we should ideally concentrate on that. So uh, what I would wish for, I have to formulate this as a wish, I would wish for all the journalists having more time to investigate the basics, not having to write, I don't know how many articles a day, more or less, not having to fight for clicks. I don't know that this happens at times and others have a bit more freedom. And I would really like, if I could wish, that they start referencing where they get their statements from. So to give one of the examples that I was often stumbling over, if it said, let's say, Viola Prisman has always done wrong predictions, I think it already says from the term that always is certainly not correct because it can't be always wrong. Um, but then I don't even know what they mean if it, because they don't have to reference where they get their statements from. I would really like it to become standard, especially in the online media, to reference where the statements come from so that everyone can go back to the basics and go back to the sources and put that into context and research themselves. Because there is, I must say, a very, very educated young generation, especially the young generation who uses the public media. There's a lot of self-regulation in the sense of people trying to put things right, putting a lot of time into that, putting uh, and counter, counter um, fight, really fighting false false facts out there. And I think people would be greatly helped if there was the need or at least the, the, the attitude to put proper references to statements as we have to do that in our uh, work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Kalika, what are your closing remarks to the session? Thank you very much for, for 
of this great session. I, I, I think for me, it just highlights the importance of ensuring that, you know, the journalists, the media, the scientists, as well as politicians for that matter, we need to have a way of being as a common goal. And so even when there are differences, there's a need and there's a need to see how we manage those differences and also to learn from one another. And I think, you know, we have highlighted some of these issues that there's a way of, of Yeah, We're, we've lost her again. Um, maybe Kalika, try to switch off your video and then we can try and have your statement again. Maybe that will help with the... Yeah, it seems like we've lost her completely now. I can... Yeah. Oh. All right. Um, I think we're giving up on the connection problems, or are we trying it once more? Yeah. Lee, can you want to have? A, yeah. I'm so sorry about this. I have no idea why my network is so unstable. But I was really just saying the importance of um, learning from one another, and I think um, what also is critical is how the messaging gets packaged, because it's becoming obvious that actually. There, there has got to be different messaging for different populations, depending at what message you're carrying across. And for me, what becomes important is who actually delivers that message. And so we do need to find a way of how we then send those messages across in what package, such that at the end of the day, the communities that we're communicating with do understand and they can make informed decisions out of our messaging. Thanks, and I'm very sorry for my network. Thank you very much. We heard that perfectly now, so that was really worth it. Um, thank you so much to all of you. Um, I think that was a very inspiring discussion on what happened during COVID to science communication, what happened to yourselves and your areas of expertise. Um, thank you for being willing to talk to us about it. Thank you for the Leopardi to the Leopardina and the SF people for hosting this. I think it was a brilliant insight into the field and the changes it had during COVID and the spotlight that COVID turned on it in a way. Uh, so, so thank you for your questions in the audience. Thank you panelists for being here. You get a virtual round of applause from me because you can't hear the audience and that's very sad, but um, I hope they enjoyed it too. And I hope you had a good time here and I'm looking forward to hearing all the great things you do in the future. Thank you very much and have a good day. <laughs>